Welcome back to the podcast, which still doesn't have a name, but there's some push that it'd be called Press On or Pressing On. I'm not a very original guy, sort of use that a lot. Maybe that's the right path, not sure. But uh, I am excited about this uh, opportunity to keep bringing to you various um, people that I'm talking with, uh, authors I'm interviewing. This time, it's three CEOs who uh, I interviewed at the forum. So the forum is, <clears throat> right now, it's a quarterly event that we do. Uh, the gathering is for women, the forum is for men. We meet at a sports bar. We used to do it once a month, uh, pre-COVID. We meet at a sports bar. It's, it's sort of designed to be the easiest invitation you can make to a guy to come to a sports bar uh, on Monday night. So we start at 6.30 and 7 o'clock uh, the program begins. 6.30 is food, 7 o'clock the program begins. It goes for 45 minutes and then Monday night football. So uh, we've had a variety of different guests at the forum. This time it's three CEOs. I'll be introducing them. And I just was exploring with them uh, sort of how they got there, how they got into the corner office, um, and any, any insights in terms of how uh, they live their life or how their faith impacts their leadership. So uh, I hope this is of interest to you, and I hope you find it profitable. Enjoy. Uh, so I am looking forward to uh, a chance to have an interaction with these uh, three men. They are uh, three friends, and uh, they're all in uh, sort of senior spots in their organization. So I'm going to introduce them, and then we'll get our conversation started. At the far end is Lance Mitchell. Lance is the CEO and has been since 2011 for Reynolds Consumer uh, Packaging Products. Products, you know, <laughs> I, I, RCP is what I wrote down. So uh, Lance has uh, has had a career, started in sales and marketing, moved his way up through various organizations, was president of a, of a company uh, before uh, coming to uh, Reynolds in 2011. And among other things, he took the company public uh, just a few years ago. So um, Lance is, uh, among other things, a father. He has two sons, uh, Drake, who is 15, and Grant, who is 13. And he's into boating and fishing. And I have seen the pictures of the fishing with he and his sons. Uh, also into barbecuing, I'll bring that up later on. Um, Barrett Davey is in the middle. Barrett is, uh, uh, you might know Barrett because Barrett ran for the Illinois State Senate in 2018 and uh, was unsuccessful in that race, won the primary, did not win the general, but went uh, in, in light of what he learned uh, started two organizations, one called Cirrus and one called Citizens Farmers, uh, looking for a long-term strategy of sort of building a machine and trying to help figure out some of the ways to help the state of Illinois. Uh, before that, uh, Barrett had been a serial entrepreneur, started a number of companies and uh, sold them. And so Barrett is also uh, a father. He has uh, three children. So, um, Ford is 15, Taylor is 12, and Carolyn is 10. And, uh, and then Ryan Harvey is uh, here. Ryan is the managing partner for Meridian, which is a compensation strategies company. And uh, Ryan, and both Ryan and Annette graduated from Hope College, and Ryan has worked in compensation strategies for a number of years uh, before he recently became the managing director for Meridian, which is an organization that's now the largest, it's one of the largest and it's the fastest growing compensation strategies companies uh, in the world. He was one of the founding partners for that. He describes his job, I've heard this before, as attending, he attends, as a professional, he attends board meetings and he has been at 3,000 of them. And among other things, his job is to say no to the CEO when you're negotiating your salary packages. So uh, in 2022, Ryan was recognized as one of the top 50 uh, people in impactful governance for the National Association of Corporate Directors, which sounds fascinating, I have to say, Ryan. Uh, Ryan has published a number of articles uh, in that field. And I know, I've known Ryan uh, for a number of years. He's also into extreme sports, or he was when he was a younger man. 
Uh, so doing the best he can. He's into taekw- ta- uh, jiu jitsu now, but he was running uh, ultra marathons for a while. And I learned if I said, Hey, Ryan, did you go for a run today? He goes, Yeah, a little bit. I'd go, Define a little bit. And sometimes a little bit was 40 miles. And I go, 40 miles, dude, is not a little bit. So um, anyway, I have uh, had the opportunity to know, as I said, all three of these guys in various capacities. Uh, I talked my way on to uh, a private jet with Lance. Lance was gracious to sponsor for uh, Reynolds, with Reynolds uh, Aluminum to sponsor Dr. Bubba uh, Smith, who I brought from Arkansas, to help start the whole Holy Smokers thing. And Lance and Bubba hit it off, and Lance agreed to sponsor Bubba on the barbecue tour. And um, one thing led to the next, and Bubba was going to be cooking at the plant outside of Hot Springs Village. And so Lance says, well, I'm going to take some of the senior team, and we'll go down there. And I said, my mom lives in Hot Springs Village. <laughs> if, there's a, if there's a direct flight to Hot Springs Village, I'm getting on that plane. So, um, and then with Barrett, I'm in a reading group with Barrett, and, uh, and I'm not bitter, but recently, having agreed to be in the, the group, he has signed an 800-page novel. <laughs> when you get into a reading group, you don't think someone's going to hand you an 800-page book, but that's Barrett. That's sort of the way he rolls. So I did read every page, barely, but I did. It was good discussion. <laughs> and it was good discussion, yep. And, uh, and as I said, Ryan and I uh, uh, have known each other the longest, so our, our wives are friends. We're in a small group together right now, and, um, and Ryan was the chairman of the Elder Board uh, for two or three years, and uh, so I was obviously, we were working closely at that point. So, let's get started. I just, uh, I, I said what you did. Just talk for a second, because uh, you're obviously in different kinds of organizations. Talk for a, a minute about what you actually do. So, Lance, you're the CEO of a big Fortune 500 company, what does that mean? So maybe I should start with a little bit of background on what Reynolds Consumer Products is. 95% of US households have one or more of our products in their pantry. So we manufacture Reynolds wrap, hefty brand waste bags, hefty brand food bags, and a disposable tableware, including hefty red cups. Little known fun fact, we have a higher market share than solo party <laughs> cups. But we don't have Toby Keith singing a song about it, so <laughs> our market share matters a little less in that regard. The company was formed in 2011 by bringing several companies together. One of them was local, which was Pactiv. Pactiv was a packaging and had some consumer products companies. The investor had previously, in 2008, bought the packaging businesses from Alcoa. This is a private investor headquartered out of New Zealand. One individual, self made and when he bought Pactiv, he wanted to create a consumer products company. But he had these three disparate companies, three disparate cultures, and I'd had a lot of experience in previous assignments and careers of putting acquisitions together. So what he wanted me to do was essentially come in and put the company together and then probably move on to the next. I've been here 12 years now, so it's been a, it's been a good run. We have grown over the last 12 years, and we grew to a point where we took the company public in January of 2020. So you think about it, January 2020 is weeks before COVID. In March of 2020, we got our first board meeting, March 8th. A week later, everybody's working remotely, and the world changed. So that's, that's Reynolds Consumer Products. What do I do on a day in and day? It's, it's different every day. Today, I met with some investment bankers about a potential acquisition. I met with several members of my team as we're planning for the 2023 planning process. You know, we're already trying to look ahead in this crazy economy for what, is, what are the earnings going to be like for our company next year. And I've never faced a planning process that's this challenging because you can't even predict next week. And the prices and costs are going up dramatically still. And we're having to do some actions in the marketplace accordingly. And so that, that's the bulk of what I did today was, was those two activities. Of course, there's a lot of smaller activities that occur, like reading 100 emails. 
But that's, I mean, that, that fundamentally is what my day was like today. Thank you. Barrett. Yeah, <clears throat> so great to be here tonight and I uh, appreciate the uh, opportunity. It's fun. Um, I, um, I, I guess I'll give a little bit of background uh, because I'm kind of on a bit of a magical mystery tour right now, uh, which is a little different than running a Fortune 500 company. Uh, but by, back, by background, I'm a, originally a corporate finance attorney and I've uh, been a recovering lawyer for um, almost 20 years. Um, so I didn't practice very long, uh, but um, have been a serial entrepreneur. And so I've always been in early stage businesses uh, and started them. And so, um, you know, for me, uh, a lot of what I spend my time doing is developing talent. Um, and, it, and, and oftentimes in startup companies, you don't have a lot of resources. Uh, so you're developing, you're developing young talent because they're cheap. Um, and, and I, I really love that. Um, I love the opportunity to like, you know, get kids out of college, recently out of college and get them going. Um, and then get it, get to understand what it is that really gets their motor humming. In fact, I was having lunch with someone today in the city who's a, a colleague from another uh, enterprise and we're doing some stuff together and we were sharing best practices and I said you know I'm, I really feel fortunate and this is I think in some regards where God comes in um, you know I have these this crop of five kids in particular and, they're, and we've got 10 we've got 13 kids at our company 13 people at our company we started a couple years ago this new endeavor uh, Suris as Mike mentioned and, and we'll probably talk about it uh, but um, we've got kind of 10 kids that are 22 to 28 years old um, and you know, I have this kind of crop of five where they all have the same job, but as they've been having that job, I've been trying to figure out, you know, they're all account managers, so they're running client accounts. Uh, and, and by the way, teaching 23 year olds how to run client accounts, you know, you're not only teaching them how to run the account, but you're teaching them how to be like adults. Um, and, uh, and, and just, you know, like, Hey, you, you, like talking to them doesn't mean you emailed them. Um, it actually means you picked up the phone and you talked to them. Uh, and we, do, we, we have those conversations all the time, every day. Some days I lose my temper. We'll talk about my bad temper in a little bit. Um, but um, what, I found, what I was telling this guy today was that I have these five kids, and some, for some reason, one of them is gravitating towards sales and sales management, and one of them is gravitating towards marketing, and one of them is gravitating towards operations, and one of them is gravitating towards you know, human capital management and human resources. And I'm really feeling blessed because they all have this fire in their eyes about different things that we need to do because we're gonna scale the heck out of what we're doing. Uh, and they're gonna be 40 or 50 people in this organization in the next 12 to 18 months. Um, and that could easily blow up if we don't have a good foundation. So um, how did I get into this? Um, I ran, I took a year off of my life in 18 to run for state Senate. I kind of felt like it was an itch I needed to scratch. Um, I was trying to teach my kids a little bit about civic engagement, civic virtue, you know, and <clears throat> I grew up on the south side of Chicago. My dad was a Chicago cop for 35 years, um, kind of was raised in a household where we were taught a lot of rules and mantras. One of them was to whom give, much is given, much is expected. Um, we've got six in my household, two have five subparts. My kids hate that, but um, I'm kind of a mantra guy, too. Um, and you know, after running and losing and, you know, I'm glad it wasn't successful because this door opened. And for me, the door was, I live in Illinois, um, and after spending a year just completely running for office 70 hours a week and meeting thousands of people, um, I realized that, you know, this, I, this is the greatest patch of dirt on the planet Earth. <laughs> like, literally, there isn't a better patch of dirt on Earth, and I'm happy to debate anybody in the audience about it. Um, I give a talk all over the country. It's called... 170 countries on earth wish they were Illinois and 40, unfortunately 49 states don't agree. Um, and, and I can talk to you about how incredible this place is. And so I, I felt like all our friends are, you know, all these friends are leaving, you know, I'm 48, but when I was running early mid forties, I, we had friends who were going to Jackson, Wyoming and Austin, Texas and Palm beach, Florida, moving their businesses and their kids were leaving with them. And my kids were young, you know, my kids are 15, 12 and 10 now. And they were, why they asked, why are our friends leaving? And, and, you know, I, of course, said, well, they're just totally misguided. Um, but um, but there's some, this thing called tax implications and whatnot. I don't know. And, and, um, and, and I realized, like, holy cow, there's, this, there's this, this, like, we have this amazing place. And, you know, if you don't fight for this place, like, where are you going to go? Because they'll come for you. So uh, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. And I'm loving it because I, I, I'm recruiting Christian uh conservative I'm, I'm actually the most like squishy of everybody in our company they all, all these young people are teasing me about being 
too squishy, but um, I'm kind of a libertarian. Uh, but I, I work with great kids every day, and I'm having a ton of fun doing it. So. Um, well, so maybe I'll take maybe this a little bit closer. I'll take a second to describe what I do before I uh, talk about my typical day. But, you know, m I've been in this career for um, about 26 years, and I would, I would guess my mother still probably can't explain, you know, what I do for a living. So it's a, it's a niche area that um, unless you have interaction with corporate boards, you probably don't know exists. But the, the, the kind of the, the quick um, run through is, as all of you I'm sure know, um, you know, shareholders of companies, they buy the shares in the company, they own the company, but you've got thousands of shareholders and they can't manage the company. So they elect a board of directors to oversee um, the management team and, and the direction of the management team. And there's a variety of things that, that that board needs to oversee, but one of the things legally that they have to oversee is the compensation of the executives. Because uh, naturally there's a, a natural conflict if executives are setting their own pay. Uh, and it gets to be very complicated. There's not only tax and legal and accounting issues, but there's strategic issues, there's design issues. Uh, and more and more, I would say the biggest issue we deal with is just public perception, investor perception, uh, keeping investors happy, make sure that you're designing plans and programs that they feel are appropriate. So, um, so we're engaged by the compensation committee and almost every public company legally has to have some sort of committee that oversees compensation. They almost always We'll hire an independent advisor, and that's where our firm comes in. So uh, I've been doing that for, like I said, right out of undergrad, got hi hired into Hewitt Associates, which um, is now part of Aon, um, and worked there for 15 years. Uh, kind of worked my way up through the executive compensation practice. Uh, about 13 years ago, a group of us purchased most of um, Hewitt's executive comp practice at the time, and that was with the core that we formed Meridian with. Uh, but I've been a partner there for the last 13 years. And then, as, as Mike mentioned, um, just recently, about a year ago, uh, was elected by the partners to, uh, to act as the managing partner. So my typical day is kind of a split. I still have a pretty healthy book of clients. Um, so today was a little bit of an unusual day. I mainly did client work today. I did maybe an hour or two of internal work, but was on the phone with lots of different clients working through all kinds of various issues, earnings fluctuations and so forth. Like Lance mentioned, a lot of... Uh, Volatility in the marketplace, and how do you uh, how do you compensate around that? Uh, but some days I'm 100% working on internal things, so HR issues, staffing, marketing plans, um, reviewing the latest advertising, or editing the latest podcast, or um, taxes, finance. So it is a lot of variety, um, and depending on what time of year it is, it, it fluctuates back and forth to more client versus more more internal. Okay, so th <clears throat> thanks to all three of you. And Barrett, I'll, we'll go to you next. So most um, most 10 and 12 year old boys don't dream of being corporate finance attorneys or uh, CEOs, uh, serial entrepreneurs. I mean, they want to play in the NFL. They want they want to they want to do something. They want to be a you know they want to be a police officer. They want to be a fireman. They want to play in the NFL. They want to do something cool. And um, to a 10 and 12 year old boy, you know, being a starched white stuffed shirt doesn't look like fun. Going to meetings, flying on airplanes, it just doesn't look like fun. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume, but maybe I'm wrong, I'm going to assume that you didn't want to do this when you started out, but that you're good at something. So when you end up in the corner office, usually, especially if you last there, you last there because you're, you're reasonably good at something. So I want to ask, uh, when did you decide you wanted to do what you do, and what is it that you're actually good at? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, I, and I, I, I do a, a fundraising seminar for lots of organizations around the state of Illinois that are grassroots organizations, and I've figured out um, in the last several years that I'm really good at raising money. Um, and um, most people hate raising money, uh, and I actually I love raising money um, because I would I only raise money for things that I'm deeply passionate about, um, and so there's a level of authenticity um, in that that makes it, to, from my perspective, very easy to do. Um, that's you know that's a very direct, simple answer yep. for your question. And it's not I what think, you thought you were going to do when you were yeah, 10. but I will I will I will say to you that. Um, you know, as a kid who grew up, you know, so I grew up by Midway Airport. You know, my dad was, like I said, was a Chicago cop. My mom was a Polish immigrant. 
who came through Ellis Island in 1951. So we were just like, you know, a super blue collar family. And, uh, um, but we had some kind of interesting uh, Forrest Gumpian experiences. Uh, one was my mom worked for TWA. So for 30 years, so we flew for free. So we didn't have any money, but we flew for free. So I've slept at more airports on floors than anybody you know. Because uh, my dad was like, hey, look, we don't have money, but we can travel. So I saw a lot of the world as a kid. Uh, and two, my mom had a twin sister. Neither of my parents have ever been skis in their lives. Uh, but my, I had a twin, my, my aunt, who's my godmother, uh, started taking me to Breckenridge, Colorado at three years old to ski. She didn't have any kids. Um, so I started getting some interesting experiences that made me kind of look around my neighborhood and go, hey, I don't want to be here. Um, for what it's worth, you know, I was like, hey, this isn't it. And so from about 10 years old, 10, 12 year old boy, I said, I'm gonna be a lawyer. So I hate to butt burst your bubble on that one. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna be a lawyer because those guys get respect. Uh, and I didn't really have perspective on that. So, and then it was like, well, how do you, you know, how do you afford to do that all that? And I, you know, I played football. I went to Fennel Oak Park, bought a football scholarship. I got recruited, went to Tulane to play football in New Orleans. So that was kind of my way out. Uh, DC for a while back here at law school and um, and I always thought I would go four to six years at a big firm which I did right out of law school was in a big firm and I would go in-house corporate and I'd wake up at 40 and be the CEO of Walmart like that was like the like that's the that's the path but I realized along the way holy cow like starting at seven years old you started like winning the candy bar candy drive sale at the Catholic grade school and then it was like, then in college, much of my dad's chagrin, I was on the Grateful Dead tour for a year selling t-shirts and beers. Uh, and, and, and like I could sell things um, and I could talk to people about things that I thought were inspiring. And they, they, they were like, yeah, I agree with you. Let's go there. And so that kind of turned into raising money. And I, we started a business in law school raising seed money for startups here in Chicago between 99 and, or 98 and 01. And we raised a bunch of money for a bunch of early stage businesses. And I, and I ended up liking one of the business plans I saw and, and the guys that had the plan weren't, they weren't capable of actually doing it. So I raised money around it and I started the company. And that's like, but again, like total God sighting. I mean, I wouldn't have planned it. And even five years ago, if you just said to me, hey, you're gonna be doing what you're doing today. When, when we decided to run, I would have been like, what, I don't know. I mean, it just yeah. happened, so. Lance, how about you? What are you good at? Well, I didn't start out thinking I'd be the CEO of the company either. I started out in, I, I went to school with the idea I was gonna be a lawyer. You know, and that's what, what I went to, you know, my first major was in, in undergrad. I got in there after about six months and realized all that reading, I am not gonna do that. that they're, they're so meticulous with words that I just, that was not me. I found out I was good with numbers. I, knew, I was always good at math, but I'd never had an accounting class. And a counselor gave me a recommendation to try accounting. And I did extremely well, and I really liked it, because there's always a correct answer in accounting, right? It's not, a, it's not some kind of a gray area. It's either right or wrong. But when I was going to college, it was difficult to get a job when I was coming out. And where I got a job was in sales with Owens Corning Fiberglass. And they took us through a six month training program, which was just tremendous. I didn't really know how to sell at that point, but I'd been president of student government and had an opportunity to really learn how to communicate. And so that's how I ended up in the sales position. Six months training, I knew how to sell. And then I was buying my first suit during that six month training program in downtown Toledo. And the CEO of our company was buying a suit that same day. So I struck up a conversation with him. It was a Saturday morning. And I realized after that conversation, it, he's no different than me. He's just had different experiences. So I did, at that point, set my goal to eventually try to get there. I mean, I, I knew it was going to be challenging, but in that sales training class, I said, that's something that I aspire to try to achieve. I, I did that, but... It was a lot of general management positions, a lot of challenges along the way, and, and some luck. I mean, let's face it, right place, right time, and, and several positions that I had the opportunity to take advantage of. So what I'm really good at, I, I think the best thing I'm good at is building a team, picking the people that are diverse, and I don't mean just gender and race, I mean diverse team members that think differently, have different backgrounds, 
have learned things differently, and then get them to be able to, to work effectively together to challenge each other and eventually come up with a good decision. Not always the right decision, but a good decision that we then collectively implement effectively. And, and so I think the best thing I've done in my career is learn how to build a team and then get out of their way. Okay, Ryan, what are you good at? Well, just to, just to uh, answer this, the question that both you answered, when I was a kid, the thing I wanted to be was an astrophysicist of all things. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm a little bit different than where I ended up. But, um, so did you it, know what an astrophysicist I did, oh, I, did? I love physics. Yeah, I was, that's okay. all I, I was obsessed with the space and physics and science when I was a kid. But uh, so it, it's only by the grace of God that I, I could do anything and that I'm good at anything. And, uh, you know, Ozzy's in my men's group. He can attest that I'm not I'm a pretty average guy. I'm not that great at anything. But a um, couple of things that I think have uh, principles that I've applied over my, my life, my career, that have led to a lot of great opportunities. One is I, I say yes to a lot of things, uh, even if I'm not sure where it's going to lead me. And I'm also, um, I also put myself in situations where I'm uncomfortable like tonight, so I said yes to Mike, and this is the most comfortable thing in the world. Um, I do that a lot. I, I do. I say yes to things. I, I find opportunities that I'm not sure where they're going to go, and I'm willing to put myself in uncomfortable situations. And I've done that um, since I was a kid. I did that through college. I mean, I can I could name item after item where you know I didn't know that if I said yes to this, where it was going to lead. But if I kind of take the family tree up through my life and say. Well, I said yes to this, and it led to this opportunity. I met that person, and now I'm in a place where this is a, this, I'm in a great place, but I had no idea I was going to get there. Um, and I'm sure there's lots of dead ends along the way, but, but just saying yes to a lot of things um, and then being willing to be uncomfortable. I mean, early in my career, um, I was the guy that I never said no to any client opportunity. I would, uh, you know, it would be something I didn't know that much about, but I knew just enough that I knew more than the client. So I was willing to be in the room and... Yeah, and you're, I'm 28 years old. I'm in the room with 45, 50 year old men, CEOs, you know, and trying to my best to provide value. Um, and I was willing to kind of stretch myself. And so that's, um, I think those principles have, have been very helpful and have led to, led to great opportunities. <clears throat> so it's generally assumed that lots of people want the jobs that you have. So with your, you're at the top, you get paid the most, you have the most opportunity, whatever. Uh, so I guess what I'm interested in is what, what is it about your job that people don't understand, that they would really not like, that you don't like? I mean, maybe you're having great fun, and that'd be, that'd be wonderful, and you can say, I'm, I'm, having, I'm having a great time. But there's clearly, I mean, I say, if you like 80% of your job, like you won the job lottery. And uh, there are times, all the time, where you go, yeah, I wouldn't be doing this if they weren't paying me. Like, you know, this is hard. And, and I, I mean, I've got, uh, I, I would describe being a pastor as a vocation. It's a calling. Uh, so I think I would end up doing this if they weren't paying me. But there's definitely parts where if I go, if I could get out of doing that, I would get out of it. And I don't think a lot of people always understand that. So uh, I'll start with you this time. Uh, we'll work our way down. So are you having fun? But what, what are the parts of the job that are hard that maybe people don't understand? Yeah. So definitely having fun, love the variety. Uh, you know, I'm newer to this role. I've been doing it for about a year. I would say one area that um, maybe I didn't expect uh, as much is how much feedback you get, positive and negative, and you, you hear all, you know, at least in the role I'm in, I'm getting feedback all the time. Some of it's positive, but you also get a lot of negative feedback. It's not necessarily all personal negative, but if something's going wrong in the firm, if somebody's having a, a personnel issue, if there's a client problem, um, at the end of the day, it ends, it ends up flowing up to me, and then I've got to figure out, okay, how do I deal with that? So learning how to filter through that, learning, you know, what are the things that you do need to take action on, what are the things you need to push back, being, being willing to say no um, to people that have different ideas, um, that's, that's a lot yeah. of learning. I've, I, someone explained to me that if, again, in the context of the church, if 95% of the people in the church are doing really well, 
50% of my time will be spent with the 5% that aren't. <laughs> and and they're either, they're, their life isn't working or they're frustrated with the church or they're frustrated with me. And that just, that fills up your docket because it just sort of comes up and you're like, okay, yeah, these things aren't working. And, and it, can, you, it can be overwhelming at some point. You think everything is going wrong. You got to step back and go, no, actually a lot of things are going right, but that's just not, they don't, they don't ask me about those things. Barrett. <clears throat> um, so, you know, as a as an entrepreneur, um, I, so I love what I do, and I have for 20 years now. Um, uh, as an entrepreneur, I've been fortunate to be involved with a couple different things where we did something no one ever had ever done before, um, or we're in the process of doing something before someone thought they should buy it and maybe change what we were doing. Um, but um, in in this instance, after my race in 2018, I. I opined that Illinois could be a red state within eight to 10 years. Uh, and most people thought I was crazy. Um, but the, the data, and I hired a PhD in data science um, to look at all the data, which by the way, the, the RNC doesn't have. So we can have a longer <laughs> conversation about the level of incompetence that rolls all the way up to the top. Um, but we hired a PhD in data science to dig into the data on the people of Illinois. And we said, okay, the, the people of Illinois are kind of like, from a values perspective, they're kind of center right, but they vote center left. Um, and I'm not talking about the policies that are coming out today. And sorry, I'm not trying to go political, but, <laughs> but I got to explain what I do here. Um, and so, in, so we started a company and we said, we're going to make Illinois red by 2030 or sooner. Um, we're going to start an operating company, a for-profit operating company, and we're going to turn a state from one party to another. That's never been done in the history of the United States. We're nobody doing that. It's crazy. Um, and we start doing it, and and um, in my in every day I'm recruiting talent. We're recruiting county and township organizations to actually jump into a program we've created, where we're creating a long-term plan and hiring an executive director and creating goals and driving a process. And then we're remaking the party, um, and so that requires me to be. I've been in 80, 80 counties of one hundred and two in the last three years, um, and that. Part the part that's what I, that's hard about the job because there's a lot of people like oh we it's infectious and fun and cool is that every day I talk to people who have a defeatist attitude like they're bummed out you know they believe that the state's you know not worth saving or we got to go a different direction and I'm I'm like so like there are days where the cheerleading energy <laughs> runs dry you yep. know and I got to go to the next town and have the next be in front of the next group. And give the next talk and there are days where i'm like yeah you guys try this <laughs> i mean it's it's it, i mean the audiences are hard and like trying to like you can't just you know it's like all right i gotta it's, it's like i imagine it's probably like a little bit church building <laughs> yeah. certainly i mean ronald reagan brings um you know jimmy carter has the malai speech and ronald reagan is morning in america and then part of it they're looking at the same data but he brings energy into the room and sometimes totally. that's a big part of the job okay yeah, I think that, first of all, I, I, I do like my job. I think I'm in the 80 percentile, but it's uh, the last two years have been challenging. I'll get into that in a minute, but it's, uh, it's a job that changes every day. There's different challenges and it, it brings a, an opportunity. I, uh, I think the biggest misconception people have about a CEO are two things. One, that they don't have a boss, right? <laughs> that they are the boss. The reality is I have a board of directors and they all look at me like I work for them and I do work for them. So I have more than one boss. I have nine bosses and I also have some very big investors. So these investors own big pieces of our stock and they expect access, they expect communications and they expect the right answers and they expect, they expect to get to ask questions. So I went from having one boss to like 15. And most people think, you know, a CEO doesn't have a boss, that they're the boss. That's not the case. The other thing I think a lot of people think of is that the CEO makes all these decisions. And that, you know, fundamentally all the decisions get moved up to him or her, and that person makes the decisions. That's not the way it works. If it worked that way, most companies would be in gridlock. You can't have one person making some big decisions, absolutely. All of them, absolutely not. What I do do, as I said a moment ago, is make sure I've got the right team in place 
and delegate and get out of their way so that they make the right decisions and they push decision making down into the organization so that the organization that's closer to our customers, both our consumers and our retail partners, they're making decisions because they've got more information and they're closer to it. So what I don't like about the job is all those 15 people that I talked about, I got to give them a lot of time. And before we were public, I didn't have to do that. I'm spending a lot of time with Wall Street, dealing with these investors and these analysts that write buy or sell reports on our company. And I'm, so, I'm spending a lot of time preparing for board meetings. And the board meetings aren't just once a quarter. That's a fallacy. Board meetings occur frequently during the course of a quarter. They're shorter, they're not two day board meetings, but I was on a phone call with two of our board members today. So th there are things occurring that they need to be kept up to speed on. They can't just make the decisions that they make on a, on a quarterly basis with two days of information and a couple of hours of prep time. The other big misconception is, and maybe the challenge, CEOs get too much credit and they get too much blame. We don't make all those decisions and we get all the credit when things go well, we get all the blame when it doesn't. That's, that's the way it is with a head coach in the NFL. That's just the way the world works. And that's the way it is. It's when you're at the top, you're responsible ultimately. The last two years, this job has been a grind between supply chain issues, not being able to staff our manufacturing plants because people walked away from work and now they don't want to go back to work. They're starting to, finally. But, you know, Reynolds Wrap, it's aluminum. Aluminum doubled in price the last year and a half. The plastic that we use to make trash bags and, and food bags doubled in price in the last two years. And that's when we could get some of it. So we had to raise prices pretty significantly. That's a challenge. You try to go to Walmart and raise prices. That's not an easy thing, especially do it six times over the course of a year and a half. So our company was 3.2 billion when we went public. We've taken a billion dollars worth of price increases in the last year and a half, a billion. That's 30% roughly. What does that mean to a price of a box of rental wrap? It's gone up significantly. And so what do people do when prices go up that much? They quit buying it. So it's a circular challenge that we're facing as we go through these economic times in this inflationary environment. And that makes this job tough. So I wanna, I wanna push here a little bit and, and say that, I mean, as a, as a, as a pastor, what I know is that uh, there's a lot more anxiety in, in the room than people let on. So people put on their game faces when they go to work, people put on their game faces when they come to church. People put on their game faces to come to an event like this. I know there are guys here who are gonna wake up at two in the morning and throw up because they're so anxious. They're gonna lose their job. They're not gonna, they're not gonna hit their quarterly numbers. Whatever's gonna happen. They're just stressed about their boss. They're stressed about whatever it is. So there's a lot of alcohol that gets, there's, there's, there's all manner of dysfunction just trying to cope with stress. So it's said that it's lonely at the top. Whether it's lonely at the top, I don't know. I guess I'm asking, is it lonely at the top and how do you manage the angst? So you're going back to investors that are mad. You've got partners that are frustrated. You're here, you're dealing with problems. And, and there's oftentimes people think, well, you can make these decisions or you got all the power and you're like, I can't make a decision and I don't have any power. If I had power, I like, what power do I have? Like, you know, I got to get three people to sign a check and I got, you know, it's all these checks and balances. So I guess I'm looking, what kind of angst do you carry? How do you process that angst? And I'm, I'm looking for... I'm looking for an answer that speaks to a group full of guys where I know that some guys have got a lot of anxiety and it's different, you know, we've all got different kinds of anxiety. Some of it's personal, some of it's we're worried about our kids or we're worried about whatever. So we'll start here, uh, Ryan, with you. Uh, lonely at the top and how do you <laughs> deal with anxiety? Uh, what's your anxiety level? What, that's so, what yeah, I mean, my anxiety level the last few years has been low. It's been very good. Um, but I've gone, definitely gone through struggles with stress and anxiety. I find with myself, 
in the past when I've really struggled, it's often six months after a really stressful time. And I, and I, there's been a few times I'm like, why do I feel so stressed out or my heart's racing and I'm not even busy right now at work. And it was like, oh yeah, this is, I'm like, this is the aftermath of six months ago. So I've, I've struggled with that uh, over the years. Um, you know, my anchor has really been Jesus Christ. Um, and uh, a number of years ago, and we may talk about this more later on, um, really started to focus on spiritual disciplines in my life um, and starting my day um, in the word, starting my day with prayer um, and starting my day with some time of silence. And I know, Mike, you've kind of mentioned some of those things, too. I have a, a similar pattern. Um, and I found the busier my day, I had to make time for that. I'd be traveling. I'd be flying somewhere, stressed out. I had, sometimes I have to get up at four in the morning to be able to make sure I could fit that in. But it was like, this day is too important not to fit that in. Because if I don't do that, this day's not going to work out the way it needs to. Um, so, um, so yeah, uh, I mean, that's, that's been, uh, I think, one of the biggest differences is starting my day. Even now, I've, I've gotten into the practice of, you know, I usually sitting on the couch in the morning. I take a look at my phone, I look at my calendar. Um, and sometimes I'll just pray over my calendar. Um, that, uh, that, you know, so the things that I'm going to be working on today, may I reflect uh, Christ in what I do. So, yeah. Jim? Barrett, what's your anxiety yeah. level and how are you coping with that? Uh, should I talk about my 10 and 12 year old daughters? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so my tongue in cheek and my, I have tongue in cheek and a serious answer, right? So, um, I, I, I don't know. You guys both go to Christ Church. Um, I do not. Um, I met Mike four or five years ago through a mutual friend who switched from first president to uh, Christ Church. And um, I, I think I was introduced to Mike through the, the emails uh, in the morning. Uh, so I, my tongue-in-cheek answer is I start my day with Mike Woodruff. Wow. <laughs> uh, um, so your anxiety level yeah. is really <laughs> high. It's all good. Uh, well, I'm, I'm still pondering who I am, but uh, that's a separate uh, from last week. But um, no, I, I mean, I think, you know, I'd echo what Ryan said. I mean, I think faith's a big part of it. But I would say, um, and, and surrender is the word, um, you know, it's asking every day um, to try to surrender um, and recognizing that um, I really don't know the things that are good for me or bad for me. Um, I, you know, so, but, but I, something I tell our team all the time, um, and actually I think one of our team members, I saw him walk in here earlier, so I was excited to see that. But um I, I tell our team um, that if if you can just admit to yourself uh, or figure out what you're really good at, and 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 you know, there's books sort with your strengths and these other books. Like if you could just if you could tell everybody around you, hey, I think I'm I'm really good at this thing, but I suck at everything else, um, and tr and I need you to have grace for me, and I'm gonna try to have grace for you. And God, I only live by God's grace, but I, I think like I get through life. I mean, my anxiety level is pretty low right now, to be to be to be fair. But I'd say of, of throughout the ups and downs of life so far, um, and I probably came to that kind of I figured out the 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 idea that I should be really honest with people about all the stuff I'm bad at, including my wife. You know, like I'm just not good at a lot of things. <laughs> And I'm not copping out or saying I'm not going to try to be better at those things, but I'm just really honest about like all the stuff I'm not good at. And I'm hoping to find people in my life that are good at those things that I can surround myself with and nurture them to kind of fill in where I'm, you know, flawed. Um, I figured that out when we were about to sell our first company to a private equity fund. And these guys, the, the venture, we had two venture funds of investors and they were just all over me because we were getting the price we wanted. And it was my fault as the CEO of the business at the time. Um, and I was, you know, they, there was things I just had no control over, but I was taking it all. And I, that's just, the anxiety was super high. I was newly married. I had a little first child. Like there was all kinds of stuff going on. We just moved to Lake Forest. It was all, and I was just like, couldn't control it. And because I thought I could control everything. Um, and then I just started kind of like, I don't know, God sighting or whatever, but figured out, hey, I just got to start surrendering and I got to start admitting what I'm bad at. Um, and so that to me is, that helps me every day. It's just, I'm radically, you know, I'm kind of constantly telling people like, Hey, I'm pretty good at a couple of things. Don't, don't ask me to do these other things. We're like, let's find some other people who could do those things. And I think people then give you a lot of room. Like they, they're like, Oh, I, that person's like, oh, I love that they're honest. I love they're willing to tell me the truth and be vulnerable with me. And, and by the way, they cut you slack along the way too. That, that's what I've found. 
Same question. <laughs> my, I, if you couldn't tell from that earlier answer, my anxiety level is pretty high. <laughs> it, it, it's just the business, the challenges in business right now are, at least if you're selling products and making products and manufacturing, they're significant. And it, it is a challenging environment trying to navigate through right now. So, and as a CEO, I'm responsible for help, you know, leading that navigation through all of this. So yeah, that puts a lot of stress onto me. And how do I get through that? Well, you must have the same conversation with Mike that I had, Ryan, because Mike has given me advice on the morning reflection and prayer. And that, that sets the day. I, you know, I have to be the chief morale officer with the rest of my team. You know, if I go in there stressed, then they're going to be stressed and they're not going to be able to solve problems. So I start off with prayer and reflection. And, you know, sometimes you hear that inner voice. I believe that inner voice is God. And he's telling you what you should do, what the right answer is for you. And I always try to listen for that inner voice every morning. Sometimes I don't hear it, sometimes I do, but regardless, that reflection and that reading, it just provides some de-stress and calm. And I also find time to exercise. And the 2 a.m. friends you've talked about, I call my 2 a.m. friends when I really need a beer or a dinner or some time. You've got to have five or six humans in your life that you can, you know, trade discussion and have that open dialogue about how to manage through it. So that's, that's how I get through those, those three things. <clears throat> so we're, we're uh, just about out of time here and I want to just want to observe a couple things and then open it up for anything that you guys might want to say. I know that the higher up an organization you go, the less likely you are to hear the truth from the people around you. And, and I often say to folks, because I had this conversation with, uh, well, this was just true in my own life, was at one point Sherry said to me, uh, the only person around here who will tell you the truth is me. <laughs> and I don't, want, I don't want the job. Like, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna be on your side, <laughs> but, but, if no one, if you don't have good enough friends that they're going to tell you, then it comes, it falls to me. And so I've, I've, I've sort of tried to hold on to that. And I've said to people, you know, you're, you've had success or you've got a lot of money or you got whatever. So there's a lot of people that want to get close to you and they're not going to tell you when you're being an idiot or a jerk. Uh, and that means it's probably going to be your spouse because you're an idiot or a jerk to them. And so you have to be more intentional about those friendships and inviting that kind of feedback and creating safe space for people to be able to, to tell the truth. So um, I'm interested in, again, we're sort of out of time. Um, so maybe you want to pick a, a, a comment. I'm interested in whether you think, whether you're optimistic about the next you know, 12 to 24 months as you're looking out at financial quarters and other things, you're bullish on America, you're really not, you're concerned. Uh, I'm interested if there's some big piece of advice that you would have given to yourself if you were, you know, 30 years younger, like, oh, I wish I, someone had said this to me, you know, so I didn't have to do that. Or just something you want to say to, you know, a, a room of 150 guys. Uh, so I'll let you each have a, a final parting comment. You can interact with that or anything you want to say. And we'll start, Lance, with you, and we'll work our way down to Ron. So I, I want to build on your comment about your 2 a.m. friends and, and having you know, the capability to be able to really be open and, and for that feedback. It starts by asking for that feedback, but it also is how you respond to it. If you're open and listening and not defensive, they will continue to share with you like your wife does, right? But if you're not, they'll... They won't be honest with you going forward. You should seek that same kind of business relationships with your colleagues. And one of the ways I've always done that is I always ask a question. I never go in to a session with my opinion. It's going to shut everything down. They're going to assume I've made my mind up. Why give me advice or 
collaborate with their peers if the decision's already been made. So always find a way to get people to open up, ask questions, and, and when they give you direct feedback, take it, use it, but don't get defensive. That would be my, that, that's how I've built my team. I've intentionally made sure that I've got people that give me feedback, that it's an okay, safe place to do that, and, and then I use it. That's how we build a, a strong team, and it's, it helps get through these really stressful times. Mm -hmm. I am concerned about the future of our economy. We keep raising interest rates, and the Fed chairman talking about intentionally eliminating jobs, that's a, that's a challenging future for the next year or two. But there's nothing we can do about that at this point. I assume you also want to say, buy Reynolds aluminum. <laughs> <laughs> that would be helpful. It's, we're going to get it below $5 a pack. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Barrett. Uh, join our citizen farmers group. No, but, um, uh, yeah, feedback's a gift. That's what we say every day. Um, my advice to myself 20 years ago, um, uh, <clears throat> take a breath, um, in particular with the ones you love the most. Um, I don't know about you guys, but uh, it took me a long time. I mean, a long time. My kids are still young, but I'd say it took me a, a number of years. Like, I, I could be super easy going with the people I work with until not but generally even tempered, but with my kids, like, I mean, <clears throat> hair trigger, um, especially with my son, my oldest, um, I'm sure you guys have that archetype too in your lives where you're like, Hey, you kind of expect certain things and then they do exactly what you would have done. Um, so yeah. I guess I would have said like, you know, give, I've learned in the last few years and I think they've all, you know, forgiven me for my bad temper, but, um, um, which is probably stress induced. Um, uh, I'm, you know, I, I think, uh, like Lance, um, I don't. I think we're we're in for some turbulence. Um, <clears throat> there's a book out there called The Storm Before the Calm, which we read in our book group. I think Mike, you read that book with us. Um, it talks about these. Thankfully, it wasn't 800 pages. No, that was short. Yeah, it wasn't Lonesome Dove, which is a great book. Um, but uh, you know, it, it talks about the um, socioeconomic cycles of the United States, and we've gone through five. And it talks about these institutional cycles. And we're, we're kind of finishing our third in our republic's history. And they point to a lot of turbulence in this decade um, from a macro perspective. Um, but I, I, this is the greatest country in the world with the greatest people in the world. Um, and there may be some short term pain, but I mean, if we're all eternally focused, then I mean, it's we're, we're in for the ride and the ride's the ride. Um, and I'm bullish about where that ride ends for all of us ultimately. So, so yeah. So uh, we've got plenty of concerns about the economy, about politics, about all kinds of things, but uh, we won't, I won't go into that. I'll just kind of maybe one last piece of, uh, of advice. It's a little bit off topic, but um, if, I, I think many of us in here are married. Some of us may not be, but never stop pursuing your wife. Um, you know, if you need to be doing the same things you were doing back when you were dating, uh, you need to be making yourself in the kind of man that she finds attractive. Um, are you able to protect her? Are you able to provide for her? Are you able to love her? Um, are you pursuing her like you did um, when you dated? Um, and if you're doing those things, um, you're going to have a stronger, much stronger marriage. Um, and if things aren't going well, uh, you probably need to step back and take a look at yourself. Um, so that would be kind of a parting piece of advice. Just keep, uh, keep chasing your wife. Okay. <laughs> Can we uh, give these men a hand?